Well, when Claire invited me to do an exhibition here, I don't want to give that to her, she said, you've been scheduled to be in T5, but if you want to use any of the other areas of the building, you're welcome to do that. And so she showed me around to different spaces. And I was struck by this theater T1 music. Um, I suppose what struck me about it was that it reminded me of theaters in a way that I knew from Toronto in the early 80s, a very, very raw, blank space. Um, and it made me think of um, theater groups like um, The Living Theater or Spalding Brain, um, theater that had really pared back for space and had used a very kind of, yeah, a very pared back theatricality as well. And at the time I was quite interested in um, sort of the act of speech in a way, the ability to how long one can speak in front of a camera or how long one can speak in front of an audience. And so um, I was watching quite a bit of Spalding Gray at the time, which might be why the correlation came up in my mind so immediately. Um, and so I was interested in potentially using that space. And so I asked Claire whether, yeah, I could do something in there. And the other thing that was sort of related to that was that a few years ago I wrote a script for a film. It was the first time I'd written a script and what I did was I actually took a film that was made in 1979 and I re-edited the film and I re-scripted it and then I organized actors to open up the film. And the thing that shocked me at the time was I never realized how little time on screen is actually designated as speaking time. So the, let's say a character picks up the ring, a telephone, and says something. There's a lot more time spent on setting up the room and the phone ringing than there actually is dialogue. And for me, this was sort of shocking because I just thought if we watch television or we watch films, it's a very basic kind of um, image of um, sort of common interaction. This is really um, giving very little space to speech, which is one of our most um, you know, valuable forms of communication as people. And I was interested in this, this brought up, um, or I began to realize that in the theater it was opposite, that the theater used dialogue to drive a narrative to a much larger extent than the film does. And so I was interested, part of the reason that I wanted to work in the theater was also to try and make a piece that um, sort of negotiated this relationship between speech as it's spoken in theater and speech as it's spoken in theater. Yeah, and I guess because the context of the previous work, just thinking I think maybe this may be more the case where I come from in Canada, 
than it is here. Um, not an enormous degree of difference, but I just noticed that the conversations that I tended to have um, as an artist in, in Canada were much more likely to revolve around um, sort of, uh, I guess, what would be um, sort of deconstructing uh, advertisements on television or recent contemporary film. And there was very little uh, differentiation between whether that film was uh, Dumb and Dumber or whether and it was like a Walt Disney kind of like um, farce or whether it was an art film. Um, so I guess that was one of the ways of, of working in Vancouver was through this appropriation, which relates in a way to its history. Jack Wall is someone who speaks a lot about appropriation and is one of the you know, figures in Vancouver. In terms of the archive, I think it's, it's perhaps a more historical negotiation of objects and um, information in a way. Mm -hmm. was a museum is an archive. Um, the Crystal Palace was a sort of archive, they both figure in the film. Um, and I suppose what they do is, for me, what I was interested in was that they are kind of structures that are regimes of perception. They display objects in particular ways, they display specific objects. Um, and in, in the way that they do that, they produce a subject in the way that the person is sort of allowed, encouraged, or dissuaded from experiencing this particular environment in certain ways. I guess, sort of linking that to this film, it seems very sort of heavily concerned with um, how subjective experience is kind of translated through history and how, in some sense, the individual's account is kind of lost through dominant discourses um, in history. Um, I just wanted to moment at the beginning of spectacular culture. And so often these um, subjective experiences that are quoted are people who went and, and tried to express the confusion at being in the space, which was enormous. I mean, it was 92,000 square meters and it clay encased um, ancient elm trees, so it was incredibly tall. And it was too big to be able to kind of conceive of um, in an entirety in a way. So you were immersed in this synthetic environment and people had a lot of, there were a lot of descriptions of sort of synesthesia. Um, so it was like, you yeah, people were sort of talking about hearing colors and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose the idea of the subject and, and history, to some extent, I guess, comes from um, the work I did for, at the university before being an artist, and I think because I did a degree in psychology. And I find it quite bizarre that psychology sort of maintains its position as a social science through uh, being very much um, sort of saying that it, it uses the uh, experimental method in a way that psychoanalysis doesn't, for example. But it really limits its ability to perceive as a result. It can only test certain things because it has to submit to this particular structure of seeing. And, um, so over and over again, learning about this process, you s gradually saw these sort of generalizations that really um, uh, prevented sort of more detailed analysis of subjective experience to an extent. And so I found that quite shocking at the time, but then it seemed to play itself out in various ways in, in our history as well. Um, and I suppose one comes up in, in I mean, yeah, so exactly. for example, there are discussions of women and their, um, their gays or their non-gays in the Victorian period, and it tends to be negotiated around the housewife. But in actual fact, most women, I think it was 55% of women were wage earners. So the chance that somebody actually was a housewife was relatively low. So you start using this, um, this kind of subject group to perform an analysis of understanding a particular period, and you get potentially the wrong answer. And so I think that this that was sort of 
sort of things that came up in terms of trying to negotiate um, flaws in history maybe, um, that come up through a kind of generalization. And, and by and large, within that, there was also a sort of distrust of subjective um, narrations and 